Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Chuck Fraser in Austin, and I'm really uh, excited to be able to participate in this Texas Heart Institute Perfusion course. Um, of course, the Heart Institute has been a preeminent center in the education of literally uh, thousands of perfusionists over the last half century, and uh, uh, this is just a, a continuation of that thread of leadership and uh, appreciate Kathy Kibler and all the folks for in, including our team here in Austin um, and uh, to have the opportunity to uh, provide a few opening comments about what I've learned about pediatric perfusion over the course of my uh, career now which is amazingly coming up on about 30 years um, so these are some of the lessons I've learned about uh, pediatric perfusion the goal being physiologic perfusion, not cookbook perfusion. So is physiologic extracorporeal support a myth? Um, or should we think of it as imperative? I would very strongly um, urge we uh, think of the latter as our responsibility. Now, historically, opinions are widely varied on this subject. Uh, many people have believed and still believe that the length of time on cardiopulmonary bypass correlates with outcomes, that speed in the operating room is paramount and is the, of the essence um, in, uh, act, in uh, safe cardiac surgery, and that maybe we've reached the limits of cardiopulmonary bypass. Now, I personally think these are holdover beliefs from other eras, and uh, this is problematic. Um, it is very true that what the surgeon believes, what the surgeon believes about what is possible matters a lot, but what the anesthesiologist believes matters more. But most importantly, what the perfusionist knows is paramount. And uh, uh, we certainly value that partnership very, very strongly. What can the surgeon do to optimize cardiopulmonary bypass? Well, quite a lot. Accurate, appropriate cannulation. Now, this seems so simple, but it's actually not. Um, particularly in pediatric cardiac surgery where size constraints are an issue, uh, sometimes we are tempted to compromise on cannula positioning, cannula uh, design, and uh, this can result in suboptimal perfusion. The surgeon should do everything uh, he or she can do to minimize blood trauma, and of course the cardiotomy suction is a, a primary source of blood injury. Accurate surgery, gentle cardiac manipulation, keeping the heart decompressed, diligent myocardial preservation by whatever method you use, and I would argue that there are a lot of good ways to preserve the heart. All of those are part of the cardiopulmonary bypass strategy. And we need to plan these operations in advance. We need to discuss our strategic goals and our approach. And most importantly, the surgeon needs to communicate, not just show up in the operating room and expect everything uh, to work out. My perspective on the role of the perfusionist. Um, this has been something that has been central to my philosophy ever since uh, I started pediatric cardiac surgery back in the early 90s. My perfusion um, counterparts are my colleagues. They're certainly not subordinate to me. Um, I like our communications to be precise, audible, unambiguous, and I do favor the notion of a readback, much as you would uh, if you were a pilot communicating with an air traffic controller. High expectations on the part of the perfusionist translate into high performance. Um, said differently, cookbook strategies, itinerant care, sloppy approach, uh, you get the results that uh, one might expect. And the perfusionist should be continually improving by rapid cycle feedback analysis. What does this mean? Look at the patients. How are they doing? Are the edematous cold, acidotic? Are they well perfused and uh, well supported? Measure, refine, repeat. Uh, practice does make perfect. 
and believe in the goal. The goal is a warm, euvolemic, biochemically normal, well-supported patient at the end of cardiopulmonary bypass. Communication, again, is paramount. We can't talk about the Texas Heart Institute without talking about Dr. Cooley, and uh, we're so grateful for the many things that he brought to the world of cardiac surgery. And likewise, his uh, counterpart, and at some levels, arch rival, uh, preeminent scholars in the development of cardiac surgery, but I would argue at certain levels they held that relationship back uh, between the perfusionist and the surgeon. And I, if I heard Dr. Cooley say it once, I heard him say it a uh, hundred times, um, don't pay attention to the pump, just get off the pump. Um, and uh, Unfortunately, this is sometimes uh, how the perfusionists are thought of in, in the operating room, which of course is uh, ridiculous. So let's think a little bit about the history. Think about where we've come. Um, probably most of y'all seen this uh, diagram of controlled cross circulation, uh, where a parent is used as the uh, pump oxygenator for a child undergoing cardiac surgery. This is kind of how we got it all started ultimate physiologic perfusion. And of course, this allowed Dr. Lily High and colleagues in Minneapolis to get started way back in the early 50s. Fast forward uh, to my residency at Johns Hopkins uh, in the mid to late 80s, where I saw children come out of the operating room cold, swollen, essentially in shock after being in the operating room. And I thought, well, I guess this is the way it is. I guess children just don't do well on bypass. How wrong I was. But I got some glimpses of things while I was there. This is yours truly on the right of the screen with my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Adachi from uh, Japan. And uh, we're doing an animal model in the, in the cardiac surgery research labs at Johns Hopkins. And one of the benefits of this is we were the perfusionists, so I learned how to run the heart-lung bypass machine and learned a lot about uh, what could go wrong, quite frankly. Um, and, of course, uh, we were pretty simple in terms of how we thought about the setup uh, in, the, in the lab there at Hopkins. But we were able to achieve some pretty amazing things uh, through a lot of practice, and one of them is this. We developed an auto-perfused working heart-lung model that was a... a um, essentially a, a extracorporeal circuit hooked up to the heart-lung block, and we could keep the heart-lung block vital and viable for 24 hours in an extracorporeal circulation and then implant these into animals and have them work very well. So that was a little window of understanding for me that prolonged physiologic perfusion uh, was not only possible, uh, it could work really well. Of course, we take that for granted with ECMO, which has always seemed to be kind of an oxymoron to me, that people would put a patient on ECMO for two weeks, um, but think that three hours on bypass was bad. Strange paradox. Um, this was our uh, team in the lab there at Hopkins and really learned a lot about perfusion. Um, and we could show in this auto-perfused uh, working heart lung model that we could keep these uh, organs in good condition for prolonged periods. But this was really the transformational experience for me when I was a fellow at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia, and got exposed to really, I think, the field-leading pediatric perfusions in the world at that time. Uh, this was my friend Stephen Horton, now Dr. Stephen Horton, uh, he achieved his Ph.D. from the University of Melbourne on all the work that he's done with physiologic perfusion. And basically, um, I learned about the setup relationship between physiologic perfusion and outcomes in small children. And this is a picture from our operating room in Melbourne uh, way back when. This was all uh, really the brainchild of Dr. Roger Mee, and uh, the, the unit that he developed there was without doubt in that era, uh, the uh, best unit in the world. Dr. Mee's mantra uh, was that children are not sta scaled down adults, and that we needed accurate machinery, appropriate cannulas, customized perfusion, and otherwise individualized perfusion for the patient. 
Um, some of the premises that uh, were developed av avoid rapid temperature changes, high flow, low pressure, thusly profound vasodilation. Dilat At that time, we were using phenoxybenzamine. Uh, more recently, we used phentolamine. And that was when I was first exposed to continuous ultrafiltration and the benefits of that. And of course, we spoke about earlier about cannula positioning, which is paramount. Okay, so um, the uh, bypass strategies again involved high flow, low pressure, profound vasodilation, long acting alpha antagonists, uh, avoiding where possible, which was most of the time, circulatory arrest, and using pH uh, stat, uh, acid base, uh, and CO2 management, uh, which I think um, uh, was, uh, you know, they were very. Uh, forward thinking in Melbourne to realize that this was uh, going to be probably the best uh, management strategy for the brain in these children. Fast forward to Texas Children's. When I came there in 1995, uh, we developed a new perfusion service. There's the, the four musketeers, Mary Claire McGarry, uh, Marianne Mueller, Deb Surprise, and Richard Owens, and we have Richard Owens here. Uh, with us in Austin after all those many years uh, carrying, carrying the flag forward. This is one of the early photographs of uh, Richard and Deb. We have favored having two perfusionists on all cases. This is uh, a real benefit when things get tough uh, and there's a lot going on. Uh, this, of course, this is uh, the uh, bypass setup that you're all familiar with. Um, but the most important thing uh, beyond the technology is the ability of the surgeon or, or the perfusionist to be able to see the patient, have, have a monitor that is for the perfusion machine. And uh, this was the first headlight camera that we used at Texas Children's. We've refined that since then, but the perfusionist needs to be able to see the heart uh, in these cases. Uh, and then, you know, we were off to the races with small baby, baby heart surgery, which became very safe and very predictable. Of course, one of the things that we worry the most about in pediatric cardiac surgery is the brain. And the perfusionist has enormous responsibility when it comes to brain protection. Um, Anti-grades for cerebral perfusion has really revolutionized artery construction in small babies. Essentially, we av avoid circulatory arrest in all patients, and uh, we developed a brain protection strategy, which includes intraoperative neuromonitoring, uh, the use of bicortical near-infrared spectroscopy to help adjudicate bypass flows. This is uh, a paper that my colleague Dr. Gottlieb and I wrote about cannula malpositioning. If you weren't using the nears, how would you know that the cannula wasn't positioned appropriately in the aortic arch? And then we can use uh, the data for novel perfusion strategies like uh, the repair of an interrupted aortic arch patient like this where you show, where what you see on the slide, varying the bypass flow rates during various times of the um, arch reconstruction, brief periods of circulatory arrest, reperfuse the brain, circulatory arrest again, and uh, hopefully a physiologic protection of the brain. The core prim principles we've reviewed before, a high flow cardiopulmonary bypass, minimize low flow bypass and hyper, hypo, uh, hypothermic circulatory arrest, and cool the patient slowly with a hematocrit uh, of at least 30 to 35%. Um, my colleague, Dr. Andropoulos, um, worked really hard on this at Texas Children's and demonstrated that physiologic brain perfusion translates into better neurodevelopment outcomes for children. Well, we're here in Austin, uh, and this is a, a photograph uh, from our setup, which of course will look very familiar to those of you that work with me at Texas Children's um, with the um, pump setup, the physiologic monitor, and the video screen. And there's the relationship we like to have in the operating room. You see myself, Dr. Gottlieb, the anesthesiologist, and the perfusionist. We can see each other. We communicate readily and uh, refine the bypass to the benefit of the patients. And uh, that, of course, is uh, what we're here to do. We were off to the races here in Austin. This is our program data sheet since we started on September uh, first of 2018. Um, I'm happy to report that uh, so far uh, we've only had two deaths in uh, over 500 patients 
and uh, we really believe that uh, uh, that the perfusion support is key to that uh, accomplishment. I will say as a surgeon, I don't worry about the length of time on bypass one bit. My job is to focus on an accurate repair. So if it takes a long time, I'm confident that the patient is being well supported, well protected. And just like the Norwood operation that I just did, the baby comes out warm, not edematous, not acidotic, 200 minutes of bypass, chest closed an hour after coming off bypass. That's the kind of su perfusion support that's possible. And uh, we're uh, very grateful for the support of our perfusion colleagues. Now, we have to keep moving this field forward. I mean, that's, of course, one of the premises of, these conf uh, con of this conference. And uh, this quote, which is on the main building here at uh, the University of Texas from Edward Gibbon is perfect in this sphere. All the human must retrograde if it doesn't advance. So keep up the good work, keep moving the field forward. Physiologic perfusion is possible and it should be reproducible in just about every setting. Thank you very much for this opportunity.